Hello and welcome to Iron Will TV. So I've been meaning to do some YouTube content for a while now, uh, actually since July. And, uh, you know, I created a show called Food, Fitness and Fisticuffs that uh, honestly, I have 11 episodes of that filmed and that's going to cover, of course, uh, various kind of like training modalities and methods towards training, uh, resistance training primarily. Um, we cover, of course, food and various foods from around the world and their nutritional value and how you can make your favorite foods fit into your plan so you're not feeling overly restricted throughout the process. And uh, we're covering like fisticuffs, right? Martial arts, various martial arts from around the world, another uh, interest of mine. So I have episodes filmed in Texas and in England. And when I got back from England, I started the editing process. And then, of course, a technological breakdown, the editing software updated itself and completely erased weeks of my work. So <laughs> fortunately, I still have the material, but the editing process, I just need to restart it all over again. So thank you for your patience. I know I've put that out there that I'm going to be doing that and it's just been a long time. So anyhow, that's my excuse on that. But really what I want to do with YouTube right now is uh, just kind of be more me and just kind of rough and ready, organic, just content where I'm providing some value and insight and, you know, sharing the knowledge that I've acquired over the last decade plus of one, overcoming obesity and skinny fatness myself, and then being a coach, 2024 is my 10th year as a coach, uh, fitness and nutrition and lifestyle and mindset and all that kind of stuff. So I just want to share that value with you guys. And like I said, it's kind of just organic. Uh, I don't need a fancy film crew to do this. Uh, I don't need it to look like a movie just as long as you can hear me and see me decently and the message is there, the value is there. That's really all I want to do with this uh, for the time being anyhow. And you know, uh, <laughs> I don't need like those thumbnails that people use where everyone just like constantly looks shocked. Like, <gasps> you know, those like soy face sh thumbnails. Of course, thumbnails are great. I understand the value in them, but basically I'm just going to put this shit together and put it out there for you guys. So anyhow, uh, first episode today, we're really just doing... Uh, a workout in my garage together. And uh, I want to share you share some more details other than just sets reps uh, with you guys. So I want some technique and explain why we're doing the amounts of intensities and volumes we're doing and the reps and reserves. So, so you can walk away from content like this, videos of mine, and uh, learn how to do this on your own because uh, I think that's really cool. I feel like it's my duty to pay these things forward after having spent so many years uh, doing them myself. So I'm in my garage gym. I'm going to walk you through uh, all the stuff I've got here in the garage and then we'll get to it. So we're going to go through uh, general warm-ups. It's a little colder in here today. It's winter in Texas. Not terribly cold. It's only like 50 degrees, but for Texans, that's like a nuclear winter. Um, and uh, walk you through that and um, yeah, we'll wrap it up with uh, basically a back day. So lots of pulling and biceps. I know I've done some back day videos in the past and people seem to like them. Um, back day does get a little bit more technical um, when we're talking about recru recruiting the lats. People tend to struggle to recruit their lats properly. So I'm going to teach you some of that today. And uh, yeah, so let's get to it. All right, real quick overview of the garage gym. I will start over here in the far end. That's my kind of junk side. <laughs> um, but we've got an assault bike. That's where I do my more higher intensity cardio once a week. We've got from Titan Fitness this hamstring curl and leg extension machine. Now, this is decent for a garage gym if it's just you or maybe someone else using this a couple times a week. Uh, Titan is good for that, for garage gym stuff. However, if I owned a gym and there's multiple people you know, going in and out of there every day, <clears throat> I would not go with Titan. It's cheap and it's not the best, but it, it gets the job done. Uh, we have a hack squat leg press machine. So this converts into uh, a hack squat. That's the position it's in now. And then uh, that bit there flops down and that turns into a leg press. It's decent. It doesn't go down as far as I'd like to. And once I get five plates on both sides, it feels like it might fall apart. So if you're really strong, um, probably wouldn't recommend that. But it, again, it gets the job done. So we have a dual cable cross machine here, uh, also from Titan Fitness. Obviously, I buy a lot of their stuff. It's more affordable. So uh, lat pull down. Um, there's the cables, cable cross. And there's even a seated row mechanism down there. It's plate loaded again. Uh, I actually really, really like that. We've got an array of dumbbells going up to 110 pounds. Bands, I like to use bands quite a bit for various things. We've got the AC because it's hot as hell in Texas, of course, in the summer. So uh, that silver stuff you see there, 
Uh, that's insulation, and I got this garage insulated. So it's not too bad here in the summer. Uh, we've got the hex bar, <coughs> and um, PRX Performance makes uh, excellent garage gym like storage stuff. So that's from PRX Performance. We've got the safety bar. I love doing uh, Hatfield squats and JM presses with that. I'll show you guys what that is eventually. And of course we have the squat rack. Now that squat rack folds into the wall if you wanna park your garage, uh, park in your garage and have some more space for your car. Um, I've got some kettlebells uh, up to 100 pounds. Uh, we've got some clubs and maces. Honestly, I just kinda use those things for lighter active recovery days. I'm not trying to get a whole lot done with those other than just some extra movement. Uh, landmine attachment, we're going to use that today for some back exercises. Again, more storage stuff. Now we've got the most important part, my brand, cool logo and flag. We've got um, axle bar from Rogue. It's uh, 35 pounds. We've got a regular straight bar, 45. A Swiss bar or football bar is what some people call it, also 45. Various grip implements, uh, captains of crush. We've got some grandfather clocks there. Uh, pinch blocks, uh, cannonballs. We have got our dip bar, very necessary piece of equipment. Um, these are farmer carry uh, frames essentially for strongman training, very fun. Uh, sandbags uh, going up to 254 pounds, also very fun. We've got the Yukon bar. I love benching with that and getting some form of box squat in with that. And uh, easy bar for uh, jam presses again, triceps, biceps type of stuff. And of course, we've got our bench and uh, some mats on the floor. And all in all, over the last, well, since the pandemic, uh, I probably put about 10K into this. So, you know, over the course of a few years, not terribly bad. Um, of course, if they want to take our gyms away again at some point, it's probably one of the best investments you can have. Anyhow, uh, let's get to our workout and I'll walk you through that. All right. So... Our first movement is a reverse grip pull up, but I'm going to warm up with a lat pull down. And I'm using this mag grip here uh, because it's very similar to my pull up grip. Now, I don't want to just go straight into pull ups. Like I said, it's cold in here. I weigh 240 pounds. Uh, and when you jump straight into a working set without warming up, the odds of you injuring yourself increase quite a bit um, you know when you're younger the objective is train hard first safety second and when you get older it's safety first train hard second so just something I've really come to terms with over the years is that you want to train smart and then train hard so I am just simply getting blood flow to the muscles and some fluids to the connective tissues and tendons and joints uh, tendons don't really carry much blood, neither do joints, but I'm really just getting the movement in and uh, getting those areas nice and warm. So what I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to do a couple warm-up sets of ascending load. So that was very light. It's like 50 pounds. And the next one I'll maybe go to 100. So I did, I don't know, 12 reps there, for example. When I go to 100, I'll do maybe eight reps, and then I'll go to maybe 150 or so and do six-ish reps, and then I'll get on the pull-up bar and then simply do maybe like two or three pull-ups just to get the, the nerves primed, the central nervous system, and get a feel for what those pull-ups are going to feel like, and then I'll get into my working set. So, by the way, I'm only doing two top sets of everything today, so it's kind of the beginning of a new training block. The volume will increase over time. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but really what I'm doing is just getting myself ready for the work. And I'll, I, the first warm up is the longest one. And since I'm training only back today, the next movements, I'll probably just do one or two quick warm up sets and then I'll go through it. I just wanted to explain to you, um, the importance of that, especially as you get a little bit older. Um, and, and oddly, you know, you train the movement more, you get into your groove. Uh, it trans, it transfers to just better technique and uh, better results through those means. So uh, I don't need to bore you with a ton of warm-up sets, so I'm essentially gonna double that load here, still light, do a little less reps, and then add weight to that, still relatively light. I'll be getting by my third warm-up set probably about 70% of my working weight in terms of my body weight, 240. And then I'll go and just do a couple reps 
at my working weight, which is my body weight, and then I'll wait a few minutes and then go do my first working set. So I'll see you in my first working set. All right, so warm up sets complete. One thing I will add, I'd like to point out, are uh, <coughs> hanging scap raises, scapula, that's the, the bone in your shoulder blades and uh, the musculature uh, in your rotator cuff around the shoulder blades that uh, tend to get injured a lot. So hanging scap raise, I'm just going into a dead hang and then using my shoulder blades to pull me up just slightly. I'm not bending my elbows, I'm not pulling with my arms. Really beneficial exercise uh, just to kind of get yourself warmed up if you are worried about shoulder injury uh, and pulling or pushing or pressing. I just do a few of those just to, just to get some, you know, warmth and fluid blood flow, sarcoplasmic fluids into the joints and whatnot. Okay, so semi-reverse grip, so not completely reverse. That hurts your elbows and wrists quite a bit. Um, so semi, and here we go. So full deep stretch at the bottom, right? Chin up a bar, and a slower eccentric. Full stretch. See, I got my chest up the whole time. So I'm going uh, two or three RIR, so two or three reps short of reserve, or reps in reserve, excuse me, short of failure, two or three reps in reserve, or two or three reps short of failure. So not going to complete failure yet. I will towards the end of this training block, training block being a certain period of time, six weeks, eight weeks, who knows, maybe... I don't see the benefit. I start seeing training fatigue because of some, because of some lifestyle factors like sleep or stress. <laughs> really depends on how I respond. So I try not to set like 12 weeks as a standard to run a program. I know I'm disciplined enough and I have the lifestyle. I've made this a lifestyle to where, yes, I could do 12 weeks, but if my biofeedback starts to tell me like, hey, you need to back off a little bit for whatever reason, I'm gonna listen to that. Um, dial it back and then hop back in. So anyhow, two or three reps in reserve for the first probably a couple weeks. Um, you know, week one, week two, I might start doing like one or two reps in reserve. So basically I'm using the same weight and adding some reps. Now, the way I like to do this for size, that's what I'm training for right now. This is my eighth week of a bulk. Um, is Week one, kind of set the pace and the standard, find a weight that challenges me within, say eight to 12 reps, okay, maybe eight to 15. So I'll start off with the lower end of that rep range. And then once I outgrow that rep range with that weight, say I start hitting like 12, 13, 14 reps consistently, I'm gonna add weight to knock me back down to eight and then progressively work my way back up. Um, and again, just doing two top sets for these first few weeks. And then once I start going closer to failure and it's really kind of that peak week, the last week or so of the training block, I'll probably add a third set, um, maybe even a fourth eventually. So I don't usually do four sets straight across the board. In fact, last time I tried to do a four set of everything program, I just got burnt out and I wasn't seeing any progress. So um, start off with minimal effective dose, accumulate, peak, drop off, right? Uh, and there's no black or white set time frame for everybody. There's ideal world, but the world isn't ideal, right? Our worlds aren't always ideal. Like I said, maybe you've got a lot of work stress. Maybe you're dealing with some insomnia. Maybe you're just dealing with some fatigue. There's some stuff going on in your life that you're still moving, you're still training, but that intensity just isn't there and fatigue accumulates. Um, that's when you want to uh, maybe dial it back. So, you know, I really think that the best coaching or the best programming is kind of more reactive but then again, there's a fine line between being smart with your training and being a bitch, okay? So what I mean by that is over the years, uh, as you accumulate knowledge and how you respond to things, um, your own biofeedback is gonna start communicating with you. 
and it takes a long time to identify whether those are excuses and some just mental barriers and narratives that you're telling yourself that aren't necessarily true, or your body is actually saying, hey, dumbass, take care, better care of me, you're doing too much, because that happens. Uh, regardless of what you like to see on social media, we are not these 100% of the time like beast mode machines that can just beat the shit out of ourselves all the time and expect to feel good and perform well. Uh, we do need that recovery time. Anyhow, spiel over. Let's get into set number two in a second. So by the way, uh, again, if you want to get bigger, uh, rest periods, right? Three, four minutes. Uh, you don't need to be neurotic and like time it and look at a, you know, each and every second of, of your minute, you know, antsy waiting, just chill out, right? Look at your phone, talk to somebody. Um, no need to do all of this like marching stuff. Should I go get on the treadmill, do burpees in between my sets? Just chill out, right? If you don't take that rest period or if, you, if you're, you're moving too much in between, like you're moving weights or you're going to do burpees or whatever reason, you could just go to a CrossFit class and that's fine. Um, but if you want to get big, bigger, Really what you want to do is rest those three, four, maybe even five minutes so that you can get the most out of the next set. If you rob yourself from that downtime in between sets, you're not going to get the most intensity out of the next set. And that's what really matters. So if you're impatient, you could really rob yourself of some gains. You could rob yourself of a handful of reps. So let's say that you wanted to do uh, at least 10 reps in your next set of say pull-ups but I went and did uh, some other shit because I'm impatient. Well, I might only get six or seven, and those are th the three reps that I missed that could eventually over time take away from the gains that I'm looking for. So anyway, rest period's really important. So we're gonna do this second set here in a moment. All right, set number two. <coughs> so really all I'm trying to do is beat last week's reps, and I already did with that first set. So I'm gonna try and beat reps here, and that's how I'm progressively overloading myself each and every week. Now, when I get to like 15 reps, I'll probably put like a 10 pound plate weight anchored to myself uh, to add some load. Um, I remember once at 222 pounds, so 18 pounds lighter than I am currently, I added 22 pounds, 10% of my body weight, and did 17 strict pull-ups in a competition with some friends of mine I think I won that competition, I don't remember, or maybe I tied with somebody. Anyhow, they were kind of fast pull-ups. I'm trying to go a little bit slower here. So the concentric explosive and then the eccentric slightly controlled. I like to get like a one to 1 1.5 or one to two ratio in terms of speed. So one, 1 1.5. So could I have done a couple more? Probably. Would technique have broken down? Probably. So I want to make sure my last reps look like my first, essentially. So I'm also logging my reps here so that I know what I have to work with next week. I need to beat them. Uh, I'm using the app that we use in my coaching service, by the way. So I am a coach. This is my 10th year's one. And I use coaches. So one of my assistant coaches, Jordan, writes my programming. He's a former national level, level bodybuilder in Canada. Um, and I love his, his programming. So I'm utilizing that. All right. So next we have a upper back bias seated cable row. So upper back bias meaning it's not going to be less lats, but kind of more traps, posterior deltoid rhomboids in between the shoulder blades um, and again those are just a couple warm-up sets don't need to film those you don't understand that already and then uh, two working sets again with two to three RIR so two to three RIR this week means that next week probably be one to two RIR reps in reserve all right so I'm gonna get that set up and I'll show you that show you what that looks like Ugh, words are hard okay so upper back biased seated cable row, um, getting traps, posterior deltoids, rhomboids, as I mentioned. Last week I did this uh, 
with 90 pounds and I got 12 and then 14 reps. So I'm getting to the higher end of the rep range I'd like to work in. So I slapped on 10 pounds. So I'm using 100 today. Uh, if I replicate those reps, it's good progressive overload. If I get the same reps uh, or a little bit less, it's still uh, setting a pace for me to progressively overload from there, okay? So I'm going kind of a wider grip. I'm actually using the, lat, the mini lat pull down bar that came with this piece of equipment. Feet nice and flat, knees slightly bent. And I'm not pulling like with my lats lower, I'm actually doing that higher, right? <sighs> stretch at the bottom. So stretch, I've got my shoulder blades completely separated. Back still relatively straight except for the upper back. Squeeze and a slower release. Make sure you get a stretch at the bottom of every rep and a big squeeze at the top of every rep. So obviously that was more reps than I got with the 90 the other week. So I think I'll add a little bit of weight for my second set here in a minute. All right, so I think I got 19 reps there at 10 pounds heavier than I had in the previous week's week. Uh, so I went in and I did like, that's too many. I don't need to be doing 19 reps, not in this training block anyhow. Um, so I put another 20 on, so I've got a, 120 pounds. So we'll see where this goes. See that pace? I'm not flying through it, right? I'm not using my body weight as momentum. I am isolating those muscles I want to use. stuck uh, all right that's probably two or three reps short of failure so notice like i mentioned i'm not using that english right that uh, just a snap when you do that a lot you see a lot of people with like the lat pull down or the row now if you're controlling it with your back and you want to train your spinal erectors up and up and down the spine that's totally fine however when you're just doing it to get like a quick blast, uh, a quick explosive pull on the cable in this scenario, there's a space and time where that explosiveness to the end range of motion, there's not a much, not much tension on the muscles that you want to create. So explode, kind of fly in, and then tension towards the end of the rep. Reality is if you want to grow, that might be fine for strength, by the way, like and performance, but if you want to grow muscle specifically, you want to maintain that tension on the muscle group throughout the whole duration of the rep and the whole set. So yeah, I could have done a lot more reps if I used momentum and sloppy form, but uh, I don't want to do that because it's kind of like a waste of energy, honestly. Um, now there are things like partials and drop sets and that kind of stuff and they're very valid. And we'll, we'll eventually cover those on this channel, but uh, right now it's not in the program. All right, on to the next movement. All right, we got a single arm cable thoracic row so thoracic kind of mid back 
So I've got the cable set up here. I'm going to get a big stretch at the bottom of every rep. I'm taking my left hand and kind of bracing on the other side of this bench. My feet are planted so I don't fall forward. I can get a little bit of leg drive in there. Big stretch. And I'm just pulling my humerus bone basically from shoulder to elbow just slightly past the spine and really trying to pack that mid lat in there. Blah, big stretch, okay? So um, I added some weight from last week. Last week I got too many reps. I think it was like 16. So I bumped up the weight by 20 pounds. I want to see how far I can go here. Sometimes this rack moves while I'm pulling. So if it does, I'll have to put more weight on it on the bottom to anchor it down. But okay, big stretch. I've got my palm facing down, and as I pull, I'm gonna pull up, turn my palm up a little bit. Big stretch. Pause for a second, and slower on the way down. I've really switched to bodybuilding is well one as you'll hear me say on repeat uh, I just want to do shit that makes me feel good and look good look good I can't even talk right now blood's in my lats um, now you know taking it to that intensity to where you're like near failure that's fun with big movements squats, deadlifts, you know, carrying heavy shit, big stones. It's really fun. And it's, it's a great feeling, just sense of accomplishment. Uh, you got, you know, you did it right. And that's the facts with weightlifting. You either did it or you didn't, right? There's no, you know, other take than that. And I, I still enjoy doing those things. However, uh, when I do them a lot at this point in life, uh, my body starts to ache. Um, I, fatigue accumulates and stuff like that. So it's not, not to say that I'll never do that stuff again. It's just not my main objective, right? Back injury, I've had back injuries. I've had a lot of agitations and elbows and shoulders and my, my tendons and my hand are inflamed. Uh, I think it was like a 500 pound deadlift years ago. Just felt a ping in my pinky tendon here and it's not broken or it didn't snap. But uh, it's, it definitely is very inflamed and it affects my wrist and it hurts sometimes. So there's just all these little things that I'd like to reduce um, and avoid over the years as I grow older because uh, it's fun now, but you know, you accumulate all those injuries, you know, when you're in your 60s, 70s, it can really make life a lot more difficult. So I'm really kind of thinking long-term, long game. Um, but to be clear, you should get strong. You should build a strength foundation to build upon, right? Because without foundation, uh, everything crumbles, right? It's like building on quicksand. Um, so building some muscle and isolating it is great. You don't necessarily get strong. You don't learn how to brace and like carry things and pick things up necessarily properly. Uh, so I do think personally, uh, you should spend a little bit of time in the beginning developing some basic strength before you really worry about other things. But that's just my personal take. It doesn't mean that you have to. It's, it's not, I'm not saying it's, a, it's the right thing to do. It's just my, my viewpoint. Anyhow, I'm not going to bore you with uh, doing this uh, unilateral training, uh, single arm, single leg. On that note, I do have some insight on unilateral training. Um, so single arm, single leg stuff, right? Very valuable, um, but can be quite demanding. So yes, we're using our muscles, but what operates the muscles, right? So central nervous system, like I said, um, if you think of your muscles as the speakers and the central nervous system as the amplifier, your muscles speakers won't perform very well if the amplifier is 
running too hot for too long. So let's just take, and I'm not too concerned about this when it comes to upper body movements because it's, it's not as heavy. But let's say we're doing heavy sets of Bulgarian split squats, right? The worst exercise possibly in the world. Um, well, if you do say one leg and then immediately switch to the left, you can do it and you can push yourself through it. But your CNS or central nervous system doesn't recognize the difference between left leg or right leg necessarily in terms of its overall uh, energy output. Um, so I personally, when it comes to lower body stuff, like heavy lower body unilateral training, I'll either um, just do one top set uh, just for that fatigue management or I'll blast one leg and then rest three to four minutes and then blast the other leg. So it makes it longer. So strictly for that purpose, I'm not a huge fan of unilateral training. Um, it's definitely very valuable and it can help improve imbalances too, by the way. Um, but when it comes to like lower body stuff, uh, yes, it's very difficult and uh, you tend to like try and you know, avoid it too. But uh, just strictly for that purpose, um, you know, you do, let's say you do four sets of Bulgarian split squats. Uh, in terms of energy output, it's almost like doing eight sets, right? That time under tension, that time under load. So um, I'll either just do one top set or I'll wait uh, a few minutes in between sets, just like I would between like squats. Anyhow, uh, I'm gonna wrap this one up and then we'll move on to the next exercise. You don't need to watch me doing a whole bunch of sets of doing that. And uh, yeah, we'll move on from there. All right, single arm landmine rows. So I've got the bar anchored into the landmine mechanism. And uh, I recommend when you're doing any landmine rowing, I know the 45 pound plates look awesome and they make you feel better because they're big. However, I recommend using smaller plates so that you can get that stretch at the bottom so that the big plate doesn't limit your range of motion at the bottom of the rep. Okay, remember stretching at the bottom of a rep is really important, no matter what the movement is, whether it be a squat, a row, a push, okay? Um, I also like this because it's a fatter grip on the end of the barbell, so you challenge your grip strength a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, last week I, I did uh, 80 pounds. It was feeling, feeling kind of heavy, but I'm feeling pretty strong and energetic today, so I slapped on more, so I'm doing 100 pounds here. Uh, wait, 50, 60, 70, 90 pounds. So I added 10 pounds. Uh, I'm feeling good. Um, so we'll see how many reps I get here. Again, just a few reps short of failure. Uh, guys, training to failure is great, right? But you don't have to do it all the time. And by the way, I'm logging my reps here um, just so I know that I have to beat uh, the log book each and every week. Um, but that's not something you have to do either. I like numbers and data a lot of times when it comes to these things, so I, I do it that way. But you could also train to failure every time and then just kind of hope for the best and that works too for a lot of people. Um, my personal experience and with a lot of clients, when we train to failure every workout, um, people run into fatigue issues um, earlier than, than desired. Uh, never desired, right? But earlier than, than expected. So uh, if we can get away with, you know, stopping a couple reps short of failure for the first few weeks of a uh, training block, so that our following weeks can be productive, uh, then that's basically the logic that I take when it comes to training. Um, so uh, not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, it's just uh, what I've found seems to work best for me and a lot of people who maybe have a lot on their plate. Now, if you're just a, if you're a bodybuilder and you're just, you know, you've got a lot of time and your stress is low and you, you like, you're really enthusiastic about spending a lot of time in the gym, um, then that's awesome and you should do that and maybe you could train to failure and your recovery ability is better than mine. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, plenty of ways to skin the cat. Uh, if it produces a result, fucking do it. Just be smart about it. Okay, so I'm bracing here in the midsection. So I'm going to get some like rotational, anti-rotation uh, throughout the mix section here. So when we want to brace in the midsection, I'm breathing into my belly and I'm locking it down.
yourself a second. Heart rate's up really high. Central nervous system is <sighs> ramped up. So I'm gonna give myself a couple minutes. Do the right side. A few minutes left, a few minutes right. And then we'll get into our last movement. So single arm, landmine rows. Very valuable exercise. All right, we'll move on to, uh, I think it's bicep curls after that. All right, so last movement is uh, outward facing bicep curl. Uh, a big storm just passed through, so uh, um, hopefully the lighting doesn't go out. Uh, I live in the Texas hill country and countryside, and when a big storm comes on through, usually electricity goes out pretty quick. So uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, anyhow, um, outward facing bicep curl, obviously this is inward facing. The outward facing kind of mimics, like you see, possibly you've seen, uh, the incline dumbbell curl, right? So incline dumbbell curl, I'm basically laying on an incline bench, not too far back, just a little bit. And my humerus, right, that bone between the shoulder and the elbow, that bone is kind of going backwards, right? I don't bring it up, right? That's a common mistake. So I'm getting a stretch here, a big stretch at the bottom. That's the whole point in this particular movement or the incline dumbbell curl is a stretch, a bigger stretch at the bottom of the movement. So big, nice stretch, chest up, coming up, squeeze and slow centric all the way down. Squeeze, slow centric all the way down. Now, like I mentioned, I'm not bringing the elbows up. That's cheating. And I'm also not bringing them up high enough to where I relax. I'm just stabilizing here. I'm not really doing anything with the biceps. I'm just kind of holding on here. So not, not completely squeezing at the top, but right about there to where I've still got tension on the bicep, okay? So here we go. Again, leaving a couple reps on reserve so I can be productive. That's uh, 60 pounds on this machine. Um, that does not equate to 30 pounds in each hand, by the way. Machines kind of add or remove some resistance in certain cases. Anyhow, a little bit more than I did last week. See where the second ta set takes me. But overall, you know, the, there's criticisms around, you know, a two-set program. Like I mentioned multiple times. It's not two sets throughout the duration of the program. I'll be adding to it. But honestly, when I used to do four or five set programs, my recovery ability was so low, if I did four or five sets throughout the whole program, that I didn't make many gains. And I blew up in size. Of course, I'm not massive, but I gained plenty of muscle when I knocked it down to two or three sets and didn't train five or six days a week but now train four. And there's even periods of time where I'll just do three full body days where I'm not really trying to accomplish anything in terms of strength or size, just maintenance. Anyhow, just to point this out, today I did two, four, six, eight sets of a back exercise. And I'm doing two sets of biceps. I, ha I do have an arm day in this program, so I'll be doing uh, probably six to eight sets of biceps throughout the week. So eight sets in the beginning of a training block total throughout a week for each and every body part is fine, it's good. Uh, doing one or two or three or maybe just four within a given week, probably not enough. Maybe if you're a complete novice and it's brand new novel stimulus to you, uh, your body will adapt, uh, but not for long. So uh, eight sets total this week for just about every body part and then um, you know, in a couple of weeks here, that'll probably go to like nine or 10 and eventually maybe, maybe 12. And I'll kind of cap it off there probably. Um, there have been studies to show that like upwards of 52 or 54 sets per week produce more gains and that makes sense. But then you have this other flip, flip side of that coin to where you're like, holy shit, I did, you know, 54 sets of every body part and I'm not sleeping and I don't recover very well and I definitely don't want to work out and I feel terrible. Um, so you can do more. But what happens 
on the other side of that, right? So that's my whole point. Um, sometimes less is more. And again, that's individual variance. Uh, it's up to you to discover uh, what's going to work best for you. And that really only comes through a, a process of trial and error over many, many months and many, many years. Uh, so, you know, uh, I will have a peak phase when I do a lot more, but currently it's not a whole lot and I feel good and I'm getting pumps and I'm feeling gains. So uh, I got one more set of bicep curls here and then we'll wrap it up. So that concludes a successful back day. Feeling good, got a pump, awesome stuff. So anyhow, um, we've got those food, fitness, and fisticuffs episodes coming your way. Uh, please just be patient. I know some of you have asked about them. Um, we've got uh, strongman training in Austin, Texas. We've got barbecue. We've got Muay Thai episodes. Uh, we've got English pub food in London in some of London's oldest pubs, so there's some history there. Uh, we've got an epic hike in England with one of my friends. We have a vegan CrossFit episode in Bristol, England, and there's plenty of like hiking in nature, Neolithic, megalithic sites, you know, the stones and the stone circles, um, not Stonehenge, cooler ones than that. So I'm really looking forward to sharing that stuff with you guys um, once they're edited. Um, outside of that, I'm going to be doing workout videos, instructional kind of stuff, just value insight, um, things that I've discovered over the years I want to share with you folks. Um, we're going to do some grocery shopping together, so I'll show you the difference between like bulking and cutting and then maintenance, which is important. You have to be at maintenance the majority of the time, honestly. And uh, yeah, just random thoughts and just kind of documenting cool stuff that I find interesting. Anyhow, remember to like and subscribe. That's how this works, I suppose, on, on YouTube. I don't really know. If you got comments or questions, leave them down in the comment section. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for chiming in.